Hello and welcome back to CE 5331, Probabilistic Methods for Civil Engineers. Uh, as a recap, we've been talking about uh, some basic concepts of probability. Uh, we talked about uncertainty and variability. Uh, uncertainty, uh, uncertainty arises because of incomplete information. And usually uh, we can minimize or sometimes even eliminate uncertainty by taking additional data. Uh, variability, on the other hand, is the natural fluctuations that we will see, uh, particularly in natural systems, and or this is the intrinsic um, uh, differences that appear um, within a system. And uh, variability, while it cannot be eliminated, um, a collection of additional data can help us uh, better characterize uh, get, characterize this variability. Uh, we also talked about sample and population. The population refers to the larger set of values that a random variable can take, and the sample uh, is a subset of that population uh, that we have either observed or monitored. So uh, we use samples to make inferences or predictions about the population. So, so the population contains uh, the unknowns, and the sample is what's known of that uh, popula of that population or what's drawn from that population. Uh, we also talked about mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive um, events and states. Uh, mutually exclusive states are states that don't overlap, they're also disjoint. And um, a system uh, can be, a random variable can be thought of as uh, being in one of the mutually exclusive states that it can be. Of course, these mutually exclusive states can be finite or infinite, uh, depending on whether the random variable is continuous or discrete. And the, the set of all possible mutually exclusive states that a random variable can be in uh, is called the collect is, is the collective exhaustive state. So, so the random variable can only be in one of the mutual exclusive states, and the random variable has to be in one of the mutually exclusive states uh, that it can possibly be, which is part of that uh, collectively exhaustive collection. Uh, we also talked about subjective and objective probabilities or the various interpretations of probabilities. Uh, in a subjective interpretation of probability, we usually see probability as being a chance. Uh, so when we say, what is the chance that it's going to rain tomorrow? Uh, we are usually, you know, if we, if we give a number, if we give a percent, and if we say, okay, there is a 20% chance or a 10% chance, uh, that's largely a subjective probability, and that is based on uh, the judgment that an expert or a person is making. Objective probabilities, on the other hand, are obtained by repeated measurements. So uh, we measure a phenomenon of interest or a variable of interest over and over again and characterize the uncertainty or the range that it takes and from there estimate uh, a probability as a relative frequency. How many times was uh, this particular random variable in a, in a specific uh, uh, state and how many uh, total observations did we make so we get that relative frequency and use that as an objective probability. So in the frequentist approach, uh, we make use of uh, objective probability and that is the frequentist interpretation of the probability. That is, uh, what is the long run frequency of observing a random variable to be in a certain state? Uh, we talked about the two basic rules of probability. Uh, the probability of a random variable being in one of the states, uh, one of those mutually exclusive states, is always between zero and one. The bookends uh, represents uh, certainty, absolute certainty. Zero means it's impossible, it's never in that state. One means it's always in that state, but usually the probability varies somewhere between one. And also because the mutually exclusive states are collectively exhaustive, the random variable variable has to be in one of these states so the sum of the total probabilities uh, is always equal to one. So those are the two basic rules of probability. So with that uh, recap, uh, again, you know, this simply shows us uh, some of the mathematics of the basic rules of probability that I just went over. Uh, the probability uh, of P of xi should always be between zero and one. 
and I have k states here, so so that I can take one of the k states, and then uh, the probability is always between zero and one. And also the summation of probabilities over all those k states uh, should be equal to one, which is the second rule of probability. And in a frequent frequentist approach, we look at uh, the number of samples of the random variable x that's in the ith state, so that is your n. Uh, sub x sub i, and then we divide that by the total number of samples to get our frequentist uh, um, uh, estimate of probability. So this works great for discrete states, and of course, uh, if we are in continuous mode, uh, we have to integrate as opposed to uh, doing discrete summation, but, but the idea still remains the same. So let's dig a little bit deeper and look at mutually exclusive and non-mutually exclusive random events. So let's say we have a section of a road in a city uh, that can hold a maximum of 20 cars. So this could be um, you know, a, a, a section of the road that uh, uh, connects between two, two other roads or two other intersections. Okay, so, so at any given time in that road, uh, there would be anywhere between 0 to 20 cars in that section. So, so at a very elementary level, we can think of 21 mutually exclusive states. So uh, an event 0 or a, would be E0 and there are 0 cars in that, uh, uh, in that lane. Um, in that road, uh, event one, E1, there is one car, uh, so on and so forth. Similarly, if you have E10, there are 10 cars, and event 21 means there are 20 cars. So, so these are your basic exclusive states, but these are not the only states. We can think of other mutually exclusive states as well. For example, uh, we can think of a situation or an event where there are less than or equal to six cars. And the less than or equal to six cars means there are zero cars, one car, two cars, three cars, four cars, uh, five cars, and six cars are all equally valid. So on this graph, uh, we have a lane that occupies uh, 20 cars. Uh, each event, each basic event is shown here, starting from E0, E1, E2, E3, E4, E20. And if I go down uh, anywhere from E0 to E6, uh, this is my no more than six cars space. And if and that is mutually exclusive from uh, e greater than ten, where we have more than ten cars, that is eleven cars, twelve cars, thirteen cars, all the way to twenty cars. So that set is being shown here uh, in this blue box, and the red box is e less than six, and see that there's no overlap between the two. So these two are mutually exclusive, or they are just disjoint. Okay, so so we can think of not just elementary uh, mutually exclusive states that the random variable can be, but we can also create um, non-elementary or more complex states and evaluate uh, whether they are mutually exclusive or not. So uh, I tend to use the word states and events interchangeably, and your book uh, follows, uh, uses the word events, uh, but uh, uh, so an event is an occurrence or a happening of, uh, of a random variable. Uh, and it's very similar to the state uh, that the system is in. Uh, Non-mutually exclusive states. Non-mutually exclusive states share some information. So if I were to look at a situation where I say uh, my random event A is made up of less than or equal to seven cars, it's an event uh, where there are less than or equal, uh, equal to seven cars or less than eight cars. So again, I would uh, pick zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and that dotted uh, blue line is my is is a representation of that event uh, where A is less than or equal to seven cars. And then if I think of another random event B where there are six to nine cars, that is, uh, there are greater than or equal to six and less than or equal to nine, so that would be six, seven, eight, and nine cars. <coughs> <coughs> in on the on that on that road and that is represented by this red box so that would be six seven eight nine and you can see that these two conditions six and seven are mutual are are common uh, to both these events that I've defined random event a where there are less than or equal to seven cars and then random event uh, 
uh, B where there are six to nine cars. And so we use the intersection operator, like you know, A intersection B uh, to get six and seven cars. So the interpretation of this intersection is that it is A and B because it's being shared by both uh, A and B or they are common to both events, okay? Uh, so the intersection operator denotes the joint probability of occurrence. So if you were to find the probability of this intersection event, uh, that would be the joint probability of occurrence of both A and B because in this situation, uh, this particular space that's hatched out here is being shared by both uh, A and B. We can also write the union operator to get the total probability and we use the union operator which is the U um, here and that is equal to um, the two events that are happening together. So either it can be A or B. So A or B would basically take it from zero cars all the way to uh, nine cars like you know so so if I were to combine these two events A and B using the union operator a, either A or B are, is, is a valid operation so you know we are looking at OR operator here as a union operator okay so if I'm so so for non mutually exclusive events um, uh, the union operator and the inter the intersection operator uh, is useful to get us started on looking at what the joint probability is and the union operator can be used for both uh, uh, mutually exclusive and non-mutually exclusive events and uh, they will give us uh, what the total probability is of the two events uh, happening. Uh, the Venn diagrams uh, which you've probably seen uh, in your early calculus classes or in uh, algebra classes, you know, in set theory classes in your high school, uh, come in handy to visualize uh, uh, mutually exclusive and non-mutually exclusive events. So if I have two mutually exclusive events, there is no overlap, they're disjoint uh, from each other. And the rule of probability is that the probability of A union B is equal to uh, the probability of occurrence of event A and the probability of occurrence of, e, uh, of B. Uh, the intersection which gives us the probability of A intersection B, which is the uh, basically the joint, you know, or the common uh, areas, the probability of the common areas of occurring A and B occurring uh, is equal to zero because there is no intersection of these two these two sets or like you know, these two Venn diagrams. On the other hand, if I go to non mutually exclusive events, uh, there is an intersection, and as you can notice, I have the probability of A union B is the probability of A which is here, plus the probability of B, which is here. And of course, I am double counting this area because I once counted it with A, and then I again counted it with B. So to remove that double counting, I am subtracting out probability of A intersection B. So probability of A union B is equal to probability of A plus probability of B uh, minus the probability of A intersection B. And this probability of A intersection B is called the joint probability because it represents the probability of uh, both events occurring, both A and B occurring uh, simultaneously. And this relationship is quite generic because uh, we know for mutually exclusive events, A intersection B is equal to zero. So the probability of A union B boils down to uh, probability of A plus probability of A B uh, because this essentially, this term here essentially becomes zero. So, uh, so when we have two events that are not mutually exclusive, uh, there is a finite non-zero joint probability associated with them. So if the, if the joint probability is equal to zero, then the, ex then the events are mutually exclusive. Uh, conditional probability. Conditional probability is also very important and plays a big role in civil engineering because in civil engineering, uh, we may not be able to measure certain random phenomenon, uh, but we might be able to measure something else that it's related to. So, so given that, uh, can we make a prediction about something that we are not measured or something that we have an in, um, an, an interest in? For example, uh, let's say B is the wind loads, and we know that uh, the probability, if we know the probability of what the wind uh, load is going to be tomorrow, 
uh, we don't know what the exact wind is, but we know the probability of my wind load being cert certain things. Uh, given that my wind load is going to be in a certain state, uh, you know, I'm going to have a wind gust of uh, 30 miles per hour or 40 miles per hour. If I know that information, uh, what I'm interested in is predicting, given that information, um, what is the probability of A? So the probability of A, this could be like, you know, uh, the stress on uh, on a building, for example, or on a roof. Like, you know, so, so what we are trying to find out is what is the probability of uh, failure of a ro roof or like, you know, a stress exceeding a certain value uh, on, the, on the roof, uh, which will cause it some damage given my wind speed is going to be a certain value. So, so the bar separates out A and B in the conditional probability. So when you, whenever you see this bar, uh, we're talking about conditional probability. And the right-hand side of that bar, which is the B, is uh, an event that we know or we think uh, we know. And then we are interested in updating the probability of B. And the Bayes rule uh, gives us a relationship between uh, the conditional probability, the joint probability, and and the probability of B, which is what occurs on the right-hand side. So it's taking the A intersection B, which is the joint probability of A and B, and then normalizing it or dividing it with respect to that uh, probability of B, uh, which is also called the marginal probability. Um, so, uh, so this Bayes rule gives us the uh, relationship between joint conditional and marginal probability. So, so one advantage of marginal pro conditional probability is that uh, if we know that event B has occurred or event B is likely to occur, uh, we can use that information to update our understanding of the unknown event A. So, you know, B here, as I said, uh, there is a prediction from the meteorological center that says that the wind speeds are going to be something, and then the event that we are interested in is will that cause roof damage or will that cause damage on my structure like you know so that could be one uh, if i know that my rainfall is going to be something you know tomorrow uh, based on that i may want to update my probability of my stream uh, stream flooding like you know so that could be a water resource example uh, and similarly in an environmental if i know that there was a, a tanker that spilled uh, uh, some chemical, uh, my probability of contaminating the water supply. Uh, so we can think of conditional probabilities um, in many different ways across disciplines of civil engineering. So again, uh, the Bayes rule, a very, very important rule. We will uh, look at this rule and application of this rule in the future, but uh, uh, this is something you may have seen in your hydrology class when you do frequency analysis or, or elsewhere, uh, but, um, but it's good to recollect that the conditional probability is related to the joint probability and the marginal probability. And you should, whenever you see this uh, pipe sign here, like, you know, the bar, the vertical bar, you should understand that that is a conditional probability. And whenever you see this uh, intersection uh, operator here, you should know that that is the joint probability. We're talking about the joint probability there. Um, um, another concept that is related to um, joint probabilities is the idea of stochastic independence. And let's say we have two events, A and B, and they are independent or have no relationship between them. So there is absolutely no relationship between event A and event B. Uh, then what is the probability of observing event A has no uh, bearing on event B? Similarly, the probability of observing A event B has no bearing on uh, event A. So, um, so under stochastic independence, knowing B will not change the probability estimate of A. So what's really happening is uh, probability of A given B is equal to probability of A intersection B divided by probability of B, which is equal to probability of A. So um, an example, I mean, you can think of many examples for this too. Uh, for example, let's say, um, I come to know that uh, there is um, uh, monsoons in India, okay? So given the fact that I know that it's raining right now in India or there are monsoons in India, uh, has very little to do with uh, whether it's going to rain in Lubbock or not. Like, you know, so even though there is 
uh, some very large scale connection uh, of atmosphere. Essentially, there are different meteorological systems that are operating in India and in the US. So, so my fact that I know it is raining in India has little bearing to understand whether it's going to rain in Lubbock. So that is, um, um, that is one example and more you know, uh, absurd example would be, uh, I know that it's raining in India, uh, will that rain cause structural damage in Lubbock uh, is, you know, uh, has no bearing, like, you know, uh, because that's not the factor that's causing structural damage in, in Lubbock. So, so, so the probability of a structure being damaged in Lubbock has no bearing on whether it's raining in India or not. So, so if I take the entropy of A union B, which is the joint probability of having rain in India and seeing a structural damage in Lubbock, uh, and then dividing it by the probability of rain in India, uh, it should be equal to probability of having structural damage in Lubbock because uh, the fact that I know uh, that it's raining in India has no bearing on whether there's going to be a structural damage here or not. Uh, so if I do the math here, uh, P of A union B, which is this, is nothing but if I multiply both sides by probability of B, I get, I, I get rid of that probability of B in the denominator and I get probability of A times the probability of B. So for the condition of stochastic independence, the joint probability of two events happening A intersection B uh, is uh, probability of A times the probability of B. So it makes, uh, you know, again, this stems uh, from the Bayes rule that we just uh, talked about. Uh, and and this gives us the condition of stochastic independence. So, so the joint probability of stochastic or statistically independent events is that the pro is the product of their probabilities. So that is another uh, very important rule that's often used as an assumption in uh, in civil engineering, especially uh, when it was very difficult to uh, construct these joint probabilities. Uh, we often made this assumption that uh, the events were independent, even though they were not fully independent uh, sometimes. So, uh, so, so this again tells us, uh, this can again be extended to multiple, you can have A intersection B intersection C and I similarly multiplied by another product. Uh, I'm just showing you the bivariate case to keep things, uh, to keep things simple. So oftentimes when you are, you know, getting into statistics or like you know, getting into probability, uh, it's natural to have some confusion between what's a mutually exclusive event versus uh, statistical independence. Uh, uh, does statistical independence mean mutual exclusivity or does mutual exclusivity means uh, independence? And actually they are two uh, very separate concepts. Like, you know, so I'm gonna illustrate again this using an example. Uh, hopefully um, this example is something that uh, you can keep in mind when you, uh, when you want to think about mutually exclusive versus independent uh, events like random events. So let's consider a geotechnical site investigation at, at some site on the East Coast. And based on the soil analysis uh, sampling, uh, we conclude that the site has three distinct soil types, sand, silts, and clay. Like, you know, so, so we can go to any parcel of that site and categorize the soil there as either sand, silt, or clay. Okay, so these are the three mutually exclusive states, which are the sand, silt, and clay. At any given point, so if I go to one location or if I go to at any one location or any one parcel uh, of that site, the joint probability of observing both silt and sand is equal to zero because if the sand is, if the soil there is categorized as sand, it is not categorized as silt. Okay? Similarly, if it's categorized as clay, it's not categorized as silt and sand. Uh, so the joint probability of observing both silt and sand is zero. Uh, the soil at that point is either a sand or a silt, but not both. And the same thing holds for like, you know, clay as well. Now let's consider two another geotechnical site, so two different geotechnical sites, one on the east coast and one on the west coast of the US. Um, if we know that the east coast site has 80% sand on that site, or the probability of finding sand uh, in that east coast site is 80%, that has no bearing on the probability of how much sand is there in the west coast site, because essentially, 
these are independent events okay they because they have different uh, depositional history they have different geo geology so they are governed by different geology so uh, but both sites have the same three mutually exclusive events so in both cases we have said the site is made up of sand silt and clay but knowing what percent of it is sand what percent of it is silt and what percent of it is clay in the east coast site uh, it has no bearing on estimating what the percent of sand, silt, and clay are in the West Coast site, and the same thing uh, and vice versa. So, so having information about one site does not help us do something about the other site. Okay? Uh, of course, if the sites were close enough, uh, maybe there was a relationship, but uh, here we have two different sites uh, and two different ends of the country uh, that are separated by about 3,000 miles or so and, uh, uh, and, and are governed by different geological depositional histories. So let's say uh, that the West Coast site has 40% sand. Then the joint probability of sand occurrence at both sites is P of AB, um, which is P of A intersection B. Another way to write joint probability is just to put a comma and not put that intersection sign. Um, so that is equal to P of A times P of B, which is 0.8 times 0.4 which is equal to 0 0.32. So the joint probability of sand occurrence in both site A and site B is 32 uh, is 32%. Uh, and that is simply because uh, if I were to take uh, a random core in one of the East Coast sites and a random core in another West Coast site, uh, there is a 32% chance. One way to interpret is that there is a 32% uh, chance of uh, seeing uh, uh, seeing uh, sand in 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 both of those in both of the scores. So, so although the correct frequentist interpretation would be, if I take hundred uh, uh, cores, say fifteen east coast site and fifteen west coast site, uh, thirty two of those cores will end up being sand, and the remaining sixty eight are going to be either silt or clay. So so again, you know, we need to think of probability as uh, long-term frequencies or long-run frequencies. So hopefully uh, this example shows you how mutually exclusive states come into play uh, versus the statistical independence. So uh, so keeping that, you know, having that concepts clear uh, is certainly a very important uh, uh, important distinction that you need to know uh, when you think, uh, when you when you want to study probability or do probabilistic analysis. So things you should know from this lecture are what are mutual and non-mutually exclusive states or events, the total probability of mutual exclusive and non-exclusive states, this is the union operator uh, or the OR operator, and then the joint probability, which is the intersection operator, and, the, and for mutually exclusive states, the joint probability is zero. For non-mutually exclusive states, uh, there is a finite joint probability, uh, which is the intersection of the, two, uh, of the two events, or the probability of occurrence of the intersection of the two events. Uh, we talked about conditional probability. Conditional probability comes into play. If I know a certain event B has occurred and then we want to use that information to update uh, our assessment of what uh, event A is um, and the Bayes rule provides us the relationship between joint and conditional probabilities. Uh, we also talked about stochastic independence. Stochastic independence is if there are two events that are stochastically independent or statistically independent then uh, the occurrence of event A has no bearing on occurrence of event B uh, or vice versa. So, so in stochastic independence, the joint probability still exists, which is equal to the product of the individual uh, probabilities. So, and again, knowing the difference between mutually exclusive and stochastic independence uh, is another important distinction that uh, you should be clear about. So, so those are the things um, uh, about you know a little bit more about like you know multivariate or bivariate uh, probabilities or looking at uh, uh, two random events or uh, you know we can. Expect extend this idea to more random events, uh, but the two random events should give you a fairly intuitive idea of how, how things work and uh, what rules of probability, particularly the Bayes theorem that we can use uh, to estimate the joint and conditional probabilities. So uh, with this lecture, I have kind of uh, gone through the basic concepts of probability. Uh, we'll do some exercises in class uh, to uh, practice and learn these concepts and see how they can be applied to applied to real world data sets. So see you all I'll see you all in class.